our first speaker of Skepticon 8. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, Skepticon 8. She was 2013 Secular Woman of the Year. She's a contributing editor for The Feminist Wire, and she's author of many books, one of which she will tell you about in just one moment. Everyone, welcome to the stage, Siki Vu Hutchinson. Good luck. Okay. Good evening, Skepticoner. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much to the Skepticon team. I know how much it's taken to make this happen and gratified to be here. And I didn't know I was going to be the first speaker, so gratified about that as well. How many of you have been um, binge watching God TV on the sly? There's, there's such a channel here in this hotel called God TV. So. So I don't know about you all, but after this is over, I think I'm going to just furtively go to my room and binge watch God TV, a.k.a. Ben Carson's campaign manager's channel. <laughs> Crazy. Um, this tagline, free white persons of good character, um, is really a commentary on the state of Christian fascism and nationalist fascism that we exist in now. So I'm going to talk a lot about that throughout uh, this presentation. Uh, recently, I had a conversation with um, some of the young men in my Young Male Scholars program. I'm an educator in South LA. And I founded this program a couple years ago to address the fact that there are no college readiness programs in this particular school that the program is, is based in. And this is a school that's in South Los Angeles. Um, it's a high school called Gardena High School. And so one of my young men, who's on the front here with the glasses, said that no one had discussed Trayvon Martin in any of his classes. And this was during a discussion that we were having about the impact of Martin's murder on the criminal justice system. At this particular school, African Americans are second in population to Latinos. Yet black males are a rarity at the college center where we were having this discussion. Black males at this particular campus are either left to their own devices, pounced on by military recruiters, or pounced on, more likely, by law enforcement. And we have three different jurisdictions represented at this particular campus. Some of you may be familiar with this horrendous image that emerged a couple weeks ago that involved uh, a young African-American girl being brutalized and dragged by a white school resource officer at Spring Valley High School in Columbia, South Carolina. And this has become emblematic of the epidemic of criminalization of very young African-American students in American public schools in a nation that prides itself on being this beacon of exceptionalist democratic citizenship. In her book, The Warmth of Other Suns, Isabel Wilkerson, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, talked about the, the manifest contradictions of this image of exceptionalist democratic citizenship in her book, which looked at the journey of African Americans from the South to the North and what has become called the Great Migration from the early 20th century into the 1970s. And so she had this to say about the mythification of Ellis Island, for example. The people did not cross the turnstiles of Ellis Island. They were already citizens. But where they came from, they were not treated as such. And so Ellis Island has always been mythicized as this proving ground, as this space of transition for white European immigrants to move into Americanness to assume new names, new identities, and purchase on an American dream that was systematically denied African American citizens. Secularism played a key role in this rite of passage and initiation, because it was by embracing the so-called vaunted Enlightenment ideals of rationalism, rugged individualism, democracy, and capitalism that these formerly reviled white European immigrants could 
reject the so-called shackles of backward religious primitivism characterized by the so-called old world, i.e. Europe. White secular worship of Thomas Jefferson is part and parcel of this theme. In mainstream American classrooms, Jefferson is mythicized not as a slaveholder and a rapist, but of course as this secular rock star and father of liberty, pushing back against the tyranny of the British Empire, when in fact it was the British who gave African American slaves the opportunity for freedom if they fought on the side of England during the Revolutionary War. And so in mainstream American classrooms, children of color are socialized to believe, white children as well, obviously, that slavery was this anomaly, that it was the original sin of the South and the South only, rather than what it really was, the engine of modern American capitalism and the articulator of many of the brutal contradictions of democratic citizenship that we labor under to this day. So apropos of that, there was a lot of backslapping and self-congratulation about the removal of the Confederate flag among South Carolina white allies after the murders of the Emanuel Nine this past summer. And the removal of the flag, though of course historic, was heralded as this moment of national catharsis and supposed racial reconciliation. But those of us who do social justice work in the community were wondering, where were all these stalwart white allies when it came to redressing the epidemic of criminalization among African American youth, or redressing the disproportionate suspension, expulsion, and push out of black girls? Where were these stalwart allies when it came to redressing the atrocious, disproportionate consignment of queer, trans, and gender non-conforming black youth to homeless and foster care facilities, precisely because of this nexus of the disproportionate mandatory minimum sentencing of African American adults and youth and homophobic, heterosexist, and transphobic public policies and perceptions. Ultimately, championing the removal of Confederate flags for white allies is low-hanging fruit, just like championing the takedown of Ten Commandments displays is low-hanging fruit for white secularists. What's a tougher nut to crack is aligning secularism and humanism with a social and racial justice agenda that is culturally relevant for people of color and that does not elicit the kind of hysterical backlash I got a few months ago when I published an article condemning the brutalization of a young African-American girl in McKinney, Texas by a white male police officer. And many of you may have seen the horrific image of this young teenager in a bikini, sprawled out on the ground, being straddled by an adult white male officer. And so the American Humanist Association published my article in the Humanist magazine, and it elicited a furor of accusation that I was playing the race card and doing an Al Sharpton on training wheels number and essentially hijacking the authentic agenda of humanism and secularism. And so with white secular allies slash friends like these, who needs Christian fascist fundamentalists? Because at the end of the day, progressives of color have a dramatically different view of what constitutes humanism versus that of the white secular safe mainstream. The white secular mainstream will never have to worry about being brutalized, much less executed for thinking, talking, walking, screwing, kissing while white. We'll never have to worry about being branded as illegal aliens, a la the reactionary fascistic propaganda of the GOP's crowning dunce and cultural amnesiac, Donald Trump, who clearly 
is unaware that his Anglo ancestors were themselves branded illegal aliens in the Southwest prior to and after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And so speaking of politics and the antidote to clown car antics, many of you may have watched the Democratic presidential debates a few weeks ago. And we were all treated to these robust condemnations on the part, of course, by Bernie Sanders and then inherited by the chief corporatist neoliberal flip-flopper Hillary Clinton. <laughs> all these condemnations about the evils of Wall Street and the big banks. What we did not hear in communities of color was any semblance of critical consciousness about the depth of economic depression for families of color, particularly African-American and Latino families. Black women have, for example, a whopping penny to the dollar of white families. And so long before Occupy Wall Street made it fashionable to lament the demise of the American dream among white progressives, joblessness, homelessness, foreclosure, and mass incarceration were brutal realities for communities of color. So for example, 8.7% of LA County's population, African Americans are 50% of its homeless population, 50% of its incarcerated population, both juvenile and adult, 30 to 40% of its foster care population. And so the lines at church-based food assistance programs, church-based job assistance programs, church-based job training programs are packed to the gills given the gravity of this economic climate. And so what realistically does humanism have to offer disenfranchised communities of color? Well, let's do a mini history lesson. African Americans and Latinos remain the most intractably residentially segregated communities in the entire United States. Affluent African Americans and Latinos live in poorer neighborhoods than do whites that are working class to lower middle class. And so, for example, in Los Angeles, in areas that are now considered to be quote unquote black ghettos, 70 years ago, these areas were predominantly white lily white enclaves. Black folk couldn't buy a house to save their lives in many of these areas due to the institutionalization of racial restrictive covenants under the Federal Housing Administration. These restrictive covenants, of course, were enforced and promoted by good white citizens, by dint of good white homeowners associations, and many of them would go around and employ tactics known as blockbusting to ensure that no black interlopers came into the area. And so fast forward into the 21st century, and many of these areas that whites fled in abject terror decades ago are now being repopulated by mostly younger whites looking for affordable housing, quote unquote. And this is a trajectory of so-called gentrification that is happening in city after city after city, and essentially displacing African American and Latino home buyers and home owners. And so what do the economics of white privilege look like in apartheid America? Well, looks like stop and frisk policies and prison pipelining and zero tolerance policies in schools, and schools that look like prisons, and a surfeit, a dearth of park space, recreational space, after school space for children of color, and virtually the reverse for white lower middle class and white working class communities. Given the gravity of this climate, African-American free thinkers like Zora Neale Hurston, for example, decades ago, of course, during the era of Jim Crow de jure segregation, knew full well the power and the appeal of organized religion 
for African Americans of all classes, not just the uneducated masses, but all classes of African Americans. Where to this day, sitting up with the black president, we can turn on the TV as African Americans and see a black woman being beaten within an inch of her life by a law enforcement officer. And I'm talking about um, a case that occurred in Los Angeles last year where a homeless African American woman was being beaten savagely by a California Highway Patrol officer. And it just happened to be captured on video by a passing citizen. And so in my book, Moral Combat, Black Atheist, Gender Politics, and the Values Wars, I look at the trajectory of black secular humanist thought and skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the lens of thinkers, activists, and intellectuals like James Baldwin and Nella Larson, an African-American female novelist who wrote the novel Quicksand way back in 1928, which features perhaps the first African-American female skeptic protagonist in American literature. Hubert Henry Harrison, an unabashed communist atheist activist. Zora Neale Hurston, of course, a skeptic, a raconteur, a novelist. A. Philip Randolph, who is not pictured here, but was a seminal socialist, the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, as well as the March on Washington movement. What all of these diverse thinkers and activists had in common was that their humanism and their commitment to secularism was steeped in a critical consciousness of and an investment in black liberation struggle. And in a recognition that humanism needed to be predicated upon dismantling white supremacy and dismantling capitalist disenfranchisement. There was no dividing line in their ideology. They were also critically conscious of the fact that religion had, in fact, provided African Americans with a platform for human rights and civil rights resistance to the lies of an empire, of a regime, supposedly based upon inalienable rights, but actually based upon the theft of black bodies and black labor. And so I grew up in a household that I will characterize as post-60s progressive in a predominantly African-American community where police brutality, state violence, racial profiling were all everyday realities. And so my humanism was informed by this nexus of sexism, racism, and injustice. There was no dividing line between humanism and a commitment to anti-racism. Many folk in the community, of course, were religious, went to church on a regular basis, read the Bible, believed that it was the literal and the living word of God, but there was diversity of worldview and perspective in this community, contrary to the monolithic portrayals of black Americana. And so we were socialized to believe as well that martyrdom at the hands of white folk was a black male thing. And this was something that was inculcated, yes, by heterosexist patriarchal institutions like the black church, but also by heterosexist patriarchal institutions like the mainstream civil rights movement, which did not deem the struggles that confronted African-American women as being worthy of going to the national barricades for. And yet my earliest memory of going to a political protest was in 1979, as a small child with my father, after the murder of an African-American woman named Eula Love. And what struck me about her murder, I mean, this was about 15 years after the 65 Watts Rebellion, what impressed me was the fact that this was a black mother killed in cold blood in her home. And home has always been mythicized as this safe space 
as a private sanctuary, as what every girl, again, in the 1970s, laboring under the blonde trinity of Barbie, Betty Crocker, and the Brady Bunch, was supposed to aspire to keep. And yet home has always been a source of bitter paradox for black women. Case in point, after Trayvon Martin's murder, there was all this hysterical propaganda about the evils of sagging pants. And lo and behold, the, the shiftless, lazy, pathological figure, icon really, of the bad black mother was trotted out to account for why it was that all of these lawless, criminal, African-American men and boys are running around committing murder and mayhem and getting themselves killed by good vigilantes like George Zimmerman and by white police officers. And so this figure and this narrative, this trope of bad black motherhood has always been serviceable when it comes to attempting to account for why it is that black homes and by extension black communities are so pathological vis-a-vis -vis the norms of white nuclear, heterosexist, heteronormative familyhood. And so from slavery to the 1965 Moynihan Report, which really codified the black matriarchal narrative, to the 2009 film Precious, which presented yet another icon of bad black motherhood, black women have either been caricatured within the popular imagination as asexual mammies or hypersexual Jezebels. And this is a regime of terrorism that was nourished under a Christian nation and codified by its very secular constitution that gave us 18th century chestnuts of legalese like this. Children got by an Englishman upon a Negro woman shall be bond or free according to the condition of the mother. And if any Christian, i.e. white person, shall commit fornication with a Negro man or woman, he shall pay double the fines of the former act. Racial slavery in the US was institutionalized on the backs and in the wombs of black women who were brought here as laborers and then of course as breeders. And this has been the key distinction in socioeconomic and cultural status between black women and white women. And so despite the pervasive stereotyping of black women as shiftless, lazy, pathological, terminally jobless with 10 kids at home drinking 40s all day, black women have the highest workforce representation amongst all groups of American women. And so when the GOP vilifies Barack Obama as the food stamp president, or vilifies birth control and abortion as the province of sex-crazed sluts, or vilifies what remains of the social welfare safety net, black women's bodies are, it's not so silent, not so secret currency. And yet despite the depth of the religious right and GOP establishment backlash to human rights, there are not droves of African American women and women of color who are rejecting organized religion for the warm embrace of secular humanism. And this has a lot to do with the disproportionate stigma that's placed upon black women's sexuality, morality, and subjectivity. It also has a lot to do with the fact that the literature on secularism and gender does not adequately represent the experiences of women of color negotiating sexism, racism, white supremacy, and apartheid in highly religious communities. And so the relative dearth of secular humanist and free thought traditions amongst women of color cannot be separated from this broader context. Given that, I founded Black Skeptics Los Angeles about five years ago to address many of these conditions and to also situate secular humanism within 
culturally responsive public educational alternatives, something that I don't see a lot of organizations doing on a grassroots level. As part of this effort, in 2013, Black Skeptics Los Angeles sponsored the First in the Family Humanist Scholarship Fund. We focus on LGBTQ, undocumented foster care, and homeless young people. We've awarded over $20,000 in scholarships to these youth. And the reason why we have a focus on these particular communities of young people is because these young people are the most vulnerable to school push out, not drop out, but push out due to zero tolerance policies, due to the criminalization that I spoke of before, due to low expectations imposed upon them by faculty, administrators, school resource providers who think that these young people are not intellectually nor socially capable enough to go on to college. Foster care youth of color have abysmal college going and college graduation rates for some of the reasons that I've invoked. African American youth are severely overrepresented in foster care, homeless populations, and juvenile jails. And contrary to mainstream discourse about school discipline, LGBTQ youth of color are more heavily impacted by prison pipelining and by push out and by zero tolerance policies. Many of you, of course, are aware uh, that our August legislators have not deemed it necessary nor important to pass the Federal DREAM Act. So many undocumented youth are basically left to their own devices when it comes to trying to find the funds to go to college. In addition to the First in the Family Humanist Scholarship and the Young Male Scholars Program, we also sponsor and support the Women's Leadership Project. And this is a feminist humanist mentoring and civic engagement program which is based in two schools. The majority of our young women are first generation college students. We work actively with parents, resource providers, administrators, faculty, community-based organizations, and our focus is on feminism, reproductive justice, HIV AIDS prevention, sexual assault awareness and sexual harassment awareness, media literacy and media advocacy, LGBTQ peer education, voter registration, and the list goes on. One of the issues that we deal with critically with regard to self-image in our young women is how young women of color internalize the normalization of sexism and misogyny in their daily lives. African American women, for example, have some of the highest rates of sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and HIV AIDS contraction in the nation. And so the prohibitions on black female sexuality that I've talked about mean that as a black girl, you don't have the luxury nor the privilege to twerk on MTV a la Miley Cyrus and be anointed this post-feminist icon. If you're a black girl, you're simply stigmatized and deemed to be a hoe. And so the issue is that there is this intersection of hypersexualization and criminalization when it comes to the experiences of black girls and women, something that is never focused on within the mainstream white-dominated feminist movement. And despite the black male focus of school-to-prison pipeline discourse, black girls have the highest rates of suspension and expulsion next to black boys. Higher than white boys, higher than Latino boys, higher in most of the data than Native American boys who also have horrendous rates of suspension and expulsion. When black women and girls are murdered by the police, the national outcry among civil rights organizations is typically muted. It's only been very recently with the Say Her Name movement supported by Black Lives Matter, that there has been national attention to the effect of state violence on the lives of black women and girls. And so this year's cohort of first in the family scholars are from all over the country, 
and we had two different lines of scholarship awards. First was to the undocumented foster care homeless and LGBTQ youth from South LA, and the second was to young people of color who identify as secular. And we were fortunate to be supported by secular organizations all over the nation, most notably the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our young people are at schools all over the country, like UCLA, UC Riverside, University of Pittsburgh, USC. And when they were asked in their essays to discuss humanist change in their communities, they talked about racial justice and over-policing. They talked about street harassment and hypersexualization. They talked about advocating for the disabled and humanistic social work. These are the next generation of humanist leaders, activists, and intellectuals that we should be looking to and lifting up when it comes to framing a social justice-oriented secular humanist agenda and pushing back against the same old business of white elites. Writing about her humanist beliefs, the University of Pittsburgh-bound winner Adrian Park said that one of the things that caused me to shy away from religion was the lack of acceptance of those who are different. Growing up, I felt like an oddball, one of the few black biracial kids in a very white neighborhood. I had dabbled in church as a child, but I kept waiting to hear God answer, and it never happened. This made no sense to me, so I left and never looked back. In the years following, I would learn that most churches weren't accepting of gays and lesbians, which only affirmed my decision. Many people are using their religion to hurt the LGBTQ community. We see it in people like the Duggars, who are campaigning to stop trans individuals from using gender-appropriate bathrooms or in the recent cases of businesses using so-called religious freedom to justify not serving gay patrons. I believe that being a humanist and being passionate about equal rights and fostering a positive community will create a much needed social change. It's worth noting that the numbers, again, of queer youth of color who are homeless and in foster care are skyrocketing. And so where do many of these young people go for help and support, they go to faith institutions. Where do juvenile offenders of color go when they're released from juvenile detention facilities? Where do they go for reentry? They go to faith institutions in many instances. Where do LGBTQ families of color, particularly African American families, go for affirmation and support? Will they go to progressive faith institutions that, in many instances, they themselves have created to push back against the tyranny of mainline black churches? And so secular humanist institutions are essentially non-existent, MIA, when it comes to serving the needs of queer folk of color. If humanism and atheism and secularism have no explicit justice agenda that speaks directly to the lived experiences, the community capital, the cultural knowledge, and struggles of people of color under, to use Bell Hooks' term, white supremacist, capitalist, heterosexist patriarchy, then the Dawkins dude bros will prevail, and instead of Marie Antoinette's let them eat cake, it will be let them wear Darwin Day t-shirts. Thank you.